This episode was powered by Paul Hodge, a financial planner who works specifically with medical professionals. He has helped members of the Brainwaves podcast grow their wealth and manage risk. Learn more about how to secure your financial future at paul-hodge.com. Welcome back to Brainwaves. My name is James Siegler. I'll be your host today. And today we're going to be talking about something different from our usual type of episode. We're going to be focusing on the Thanksgiving foods that you eat and hopefully trying not to scare you too far away from them. For this episode today, I've got Dr. Jason Maley, and he's going to be giving us some commentary on the types of foods that we commonly eat for Thanksgiving. So welcome to the show, Jason. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jim. So we actually know each other from pretty far back. So let's talk first about your type of Thanksgiving. You're from Boston and I'm from Arkansas, so our Thanksgivings are similar but different. Yeah, so um, I grew up south of Boston, not too far from where the pilgrims came to Plymouth Rock on the south shore of Massachusetts. And I I guess our Thanksgiving was a pretty typical Thanksgiving with turkey. My mom's biggest dish is sweet potato casserole, which is my favorite. Gravy, cranberry sauce. My favorite is the jelly from the actual tin, not real cranberry sauce. Mashed potatoes. Nothing really unique or exceptional except for, I guess, my mom's sweet potato casserole. You know, I think coming from a a rural or Kansan background, I would add maybe a few more exotic flares to that. Uh, We do have your typical, you know, turkey and gravy and stuffing and sweet potato casserole. It's my favorite dish as well, but we also go hunting and, you know, we cook a lot of duck. You know, we do get a lot of wild game in, in there with our turkey. So we will focus on some of the more common things that are eaten during Thanksgiving as well as some of the more exotic and eccentric types of foods. Uh, I think it's best if we probably start with the order of the plating as it's served. So starting kind of with the appetizers. Hand washing is very important in the preparation of food. So Jason, can you kind of talk to us about the importance of hand washing? Yeah, sure. So I guess there are a variety of bacteria that people get through foodborne illnesses, which are mostly as a result of poor hand hygiene. It's either spread of bacteria that people have in their feces, as terrible as it sounds, or something that's on your hands like Staph aureus that when you prepare food by hand can produce a toxin and cause this 24-hour GI illness. And, you know, one of the more interesting toxins that we do see in neurology is the toxin produced by Clostridium botulinum. So we usually see Clostridium botulinum toxin poisoning in in several different instances, and everybody knows the classic story of the, you know, four to six-month-old infant who has a flaccid paralysis and a very weak cry and hypotonia. But there are a couple of other types of botulinum poisoning scenarios to, to keep in mind. The type of botulism just described, infant botulism, is the most common form of botulism in the United States, accounting for 80 to 100 cases annually, and it's surprisingly common in Pennsylvania. But in addition to infant botulism, there are actually three other major syndromes worth noting. Wound botulism with in situ toxin production, adult intestinal toxemia, and foodborne botulism. Unlike infant botulism, which results from C. botulinum bacterial colonization in the intestines, something that doesn't happen in normal adult gastrointestinal flora, foodborne botulism is the result of ingestion of the botulinum toxin itself. Normal adult flora will compete with C. botulinum under normal circumstances, and no serious harm typically comes from ingestion of the bacteria or its spores. But when the toxin is ingested in high concentrations in food board botulism, without fail, the symptoms evolve as a descending paralysis, usually starting with bilateral and symmetric cranial neuropathies and eventually compromising respiratory function. The unique thing about botulism is that it's caused by bacteria that produces these toxic spores. If they are present in food, it's because the spores haven't been killed. So in especially home canning, that's a concern where you're taking fresh fruit and preparing them in a way that you're going to try to preserve it for a long period of time. But if you don't heat it up adequately to kill those spores prior to preserving, then over whatever time period it sits on your shelf, those spores are forming. Studies have shown that over 90% of foodborne causes of botulism are acquired from non-commercial food items. And often, the diagnosis is clinical, because delay in treatment with botulinum immunoglobulin G can have a dramatic impact on recovery. The differential diagnosis for symptoms of rapidly progressive descending weakness is incredibly short. Guillain-Barre syndrome, specifically the Miller-Fisher variant, although this paralysis does not technically descend, myasthenia gravis, which can manifest with ocular or bulbar weakness, 
tick paralysis, and very rare stroke syndromes, especially those of the thalamus, midbrain, and brainstem. Okay, so moving on to the next plates, the cheese plates as it's being served, usually we think of listeriosis. Jason, can you talk to us about how listeria typically manifests in the immunocompetent adult? Listeriosis from Listeria monocytogenes is really associated with illnesses that we think of in association with pregnant women, neonates, and then the elderly. And the big deal in pregnant women is really about the effect on the baby, and that's because infection during pregnancy with listeria can lead to stillbirth and other fetal abnormalities. With older folks, the time we think about listeria clinically is when someone's infected with this and it's leading to symptoms of meningitis or meningoencephalitis. The other unique things about listeria, especially in the CSF, is that it doesn't always look like the typical bacterial pattern, which will have a low glucose, high protein, high white blood cell count, and a neutrophilic shift in the differential. It can actually look almost on a spectrum towards aseptic meningitis, where the protein may not be as high, the glucose may be not as low or normal, and the white blood cell count may have more lymphocytes. The other unique aspect is that it may be a little more of an indolent course that develops over several days and isn't the rapid onset like meningococcus or streptococcal meningitis. Like Dr. Maley said, we typically think of Listeria monocytogenes as one of the more common agents of bacterial meningitis in neonates, the elderly, and the immunocompromised. According to data from the CDC, Listeria accounts for 20% of all bacterial causes of neonatal meningitis, and another 20% of bacterial causes in adults over the age of 50, which is why these age groups always get ampicillin for meningitis coverage. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole can be used in patients with a penicillin allergy. Listeria typically causes a meningitis with or without encephalitis and brain or spinal cord abscess, although most neurologists package it in their differential diagnosis of rhomboencephalitis with subacute cranial neuropathies, cerebellar ataxia, and weakness or numbness. This infection warrants special attention, as it has been the agent responsible for several recent outbreaks in the last several years, most notably in Sabra's hummus production line, which forced the company to recall over 30,000 products in April 2015, and in several Bluebell products resulting in three deaths and the shutdown of production facilities in several southern U.S. states. But instead of scaring you any further, let's move on to the main courses in a typical Thanksgiving feast. So let's move on to the the main courses, and we talked about turkey, and I think that we have a lot that we can say about tryptophan. What's all this hype about tryptophan and sedation and sleepiness? People typically think of this tryptophan association with turkey, but it turns out that there are nearly identical concentrations of tryptophan in other foods like milk and chicken and tuna and other things that you're having throughout the year. People associate tryptophan with the sleepiness because it's an important biochemical precursor to serotonin and melatonin, but dietary tryptophan really accounts for a minority of these neurotransmitters, and most of the serotonin and melatonin made by tryptophan is using tryptophan that's already been there in your body, not dietary tryptophan. So the real relevance of sleepiness, as far as I understand it after your large Thanksgiving meal, really is not related to the tryptophan, but related to the parasympathetic response that happens afterwards with shunting of blood towards your GI system, away from your brain and your muscles. And that only makes sense. And we're definitely going to talk about alcohol as its own kind of somnogen later on in the episode. But to kind of keep this episode moving along, I think we're just going to move on to the next meat dish, which for most people can be like a ham or a pork-based dish. Neurocystocercosis always comes up in the differential diagnosis for certain types of brain lesions, especially in those of patients from third world countries. And I think it's easy for us to get the life cycle of tinea solium confused in how we acquire it and how it can invade the nervous system. So can you kind of walk us through these steps? Yeah, so similar to a lot of other infectious diseases, the tough part to talk about is that these are really transmitted person to person. So they're in someone's GI system and they're passed in the feces and then through transmission during preparation of food, or if there's water contamination in an area where someone's living that doesn't have good sanitation, then they can acquire these eggs. So once someone ingests these, the eggs will hatch and will ultimately cross the intestinal lumen and spread to other areas of the body through uh, the portal venous system. And so one of the things that I remember learning about in medical school especially is worldwide neurocystosarcosis is a very common cause of epilepsy. 
Seizures may be the most common symptom of neurosister sarcosis seen in 80% of patients with intraparenchymal lesions, but it is also a major cause of focal neurologic deficits and can produce significant morbidity among patients due to intracranial hypertension. Elevated intracranial pressure due to neurosister sarcosis is the result of tinea invasion of the arachnoid granulations causing arachnoiditis, granular ependymitis, or ventricular cysts. Also realize that neurosister sarcosis is quite common, especially among foreign patients. So when a patient comes to your office complaining of fatigue or dizziness, and they have a small calcified dead scolex on a head CT, think about whether that old lesion is truly contributing to your patient's symptoms. The majority of lesions actually heal spontaneously, and you see these calcifications on head CT years and decades down the road. The important thing to distinguish is whether or not you have active neurosystem sarcosis or if you have an old calcified scolex that is not harboring any kind of active parasite. I kind of want to recount this story that I'm calling the parable of the potato, for lack of a better story name. So we're in London in 1979 at an all-boys school, and the autumn term has just resumed. But instead of returning to their studies, many students have become quite ill, uh, with symptoms characterized by fever and nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and as many as 100 patients had some sort of central nervous system manifestations usually beginning with some level of altered mentation, lethargy, and then eventually seizures and coma in some cases. It turns out after reviewing what these kids had eaten at school that everybody had eaten the same batch of potatoes about 14 hours before, and the potatoes had been held in storage from the preceding summer term. Luckily, none of the students or faculty died from this incident, and uh, most were left without any kind of long-term sequela from the exposure. And exposure to this type of toxin from these potatoes has actually been described previously up to, you know, even 100 years before all this in several different types of outbreaks. So the agent responsible for this was solanine, which is a glycoalkaloid cholinesterase inhibitor, which in sufficient concentrations can produce the symptoms of cholinergic toxicity, the sludge symptoms, and seizures and encephalopathy that we see in, in really high concentrations. And it's thought that solanine concentrations in potatoes may rise as potatoes ripen very quickly. And so as they turn green, which green is actually a marker of the chlorophyll concentration of the potato, not the solanine concentration, but the chlorophyll concentration serves as a surrogate for the level of solanine in potatoes. So once your potato starts to turn green or starts to sprout too much, that may suggest that the solanine levels are rising and it may increase the risk of a cholinergic toxidrome after ingestion even with some cooking of this. And that's why you're always told not to eat these greened potatoes. So Jim, you mentioned hunting during your Thanksgiving. Did you guys ever get anything strange or exotic that we wouldn't have eaten in Boston? You know, in my family, we usually eat the turkey and ham and things you can buy at your local grocery stores, but uh, we do also go hunting for duck on our own. I do have friends who go deer hunting in the winter, and one type of disease that we talk about every once in a while in neurology is this uh, chronic wasting disease of deer and elk. It usually affects white-tailed deer, and um, it's most commonly seen in uh, deer and elk species in North America and Canada, and we have, in a way, sort of exported it to other countries like Korea, actually, so there have been cases of this chronic wasting disease in, in Korea. It's actually a prion disease, like creutzfeldt jakob mad cow disease. And as the name suggests, these animals will present pretty rapidly with loss of weight and inability to eat and a toxic gait. So, you know, if you see a deer that's kind of stumbling around, maybe a little bit, a little bit gone, you know, you might want to avoid hunting for that. Uh, There haven't been any acquired cases of chronic wasting disease among those who've eaten deer or elk with the chronic wasting disease, but I really wouldn't test it. But enough about my people, Jason. Let's talk about your people and these pilgrims. Growing up in Massachusetts and visiting Plymouth Plantation, did you learn anything interesting about disease among pilgrims for Thanksgiving? I guess I probably didn't learn much growing up. I just remember visiting log houses with a dirt ground and walking around and people dressed up in funny clothes. I would say maybe an interesting disease associated with the pilgrims and other travelers during that era who were taking long trips overseas was scurvy, which is deficiency in vitamin C or ascorbic acid. And it was a terrible disease because vitamin C is essential to create collagen in your body. And collagen is one of the most important building blocks for things like skin and blood vessels and connective tissue. 
you have to take vitamin C from your diet. Your body does not produce it itself, like vitamin D. So if you're truly deficient in it, people would develop fragile blood vessels, start with bruising and then develop bleeding into their skin in areas which is called purpura. They would have progression of that, have mucosal bleeding in areas where there was minor trauma, have joint and muscle pain, and then ultimately they would die from hemorrhage, including intracranial hemorrhages. So what they would do is just have lemon juice available during these trips, or lemons available, and supplementation with lemons was adequate to replace the necessary dietary vitamin C. And similarly, this is very rare in the U.S. because it happens in specific populations who don't have access to food or aren't taking it in. So people with severe alcoholism, malnutrition from homelessness, eating disorders. In other countries, it does occur, but we really don't see it here in the U.S. except for maybe in those populations. The majority of physical manifestations related to vitamin C deficiency are due to its role in the synthesis of collagen, as Dr. Maley indicated. Hemorrhage into the skin, soft tissues, and less commonly, the central nervous system, occurs in severe cases of scurvy. However, other symptoms relating to impaired vasomotor activity like dyspnea and hypotension have also been reported. Because this is a neurology podcast after all, we can't get away without mentioning the role of vitamin C as a cofactor in the synthesis of norepinephrine from dopamine via dopamine beta monooxygenase. Finally, whenever vitamin C deficiency is suspected, as in the aforementioned cases of severe malnutrition, drug or alcohol abuse, or even impaired gastrointestinal absorption, a thorough investigation into other vitamin and mineral deficiencies should be pursued. Now, we can't wrap up the episode without at least even mentioning alcohol. So, Jason, what are your thoughts on alcohol at Thanksgiving? In terms of illnesses that can be associated with alcohol, they mainly all result from what alcohol replaces, which is things like vitamins and then some other non-neurologic illnesses that you're not interested in, like uh, (laughs) beer potomania and things that lead to hyponatremia. That that can cause altered mental status. That's true, though. Yeah. If severe enough, it can cause altered mental status as a result of cerebral edema with hyponatremia. Patients who are chronic alcoholics can have deficiencies in B vitamins, so vitamin B1, thiamine. If you have a deficiency in that, you can have dry berry berry, can develop peripheral neuropathies. You can also have Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, where you can have ataxia, ophthalmoplegia, dementia, and nystagmus. Deficiency in vitamin B3, niacin, can cause pellagra, which is the characteristic triadus, diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. In addition to these more chronic consequences of alcohol abuse, acute intoxication causes a reversible cerebellar dysfunction not unlike that seen in aminoglycoside, platinum-based chemotherapies, and phenytoin toxicity. With chronic alcohol ingestion, as in chronic phenytoin use, the cerebellum may atrophy, resulting in progressive irreversible cerebellar dysfunction. The cerebral cortex will likewise atrophy with chronic alcohol use. Independent of vitamin deficiencies, alcohol use should be in nearly every differential diagnosis for a length-dependent axonal polyneuropathy, similar to what is observed in chronic diabetics and those with long-standing hepatic or renal disease. More interestingly, the rare condition of Marcia Fava Bignami disease has been described initially among Italian wine drinkers, but is now recognized to affect alcoholics of any nationality. Marchia fava bignami disease, or MBD, is characterized by demyelination and necrosis of subcortical white matter, specifically all aspects of the corpus callosum. According to large cohorts, the most common presenting symptoms of MBD included altered mental status or loss of consciousness, gait impairment, and dysarthria, but rarely focal neurologic deficits may be present. Early treatment with parenteral thiamine is thought to improve outcomes, as in cases of Wernicke's encephalopathy, but long-term treatment involves substance abuse counseling and nutritional support. So moving on beyond just the alcoholics, I mean, we're having Thanksgiving with our families, Jason. Let's be a little bit more okay. respectful here. What are some of the beneficial effects of alcohol? Let's turn it on its side and let's talk about the positive effects of alcohol. Yeah, so for a while there's been an association of moderate alcohol intake both beer and wine with improved cardiovascular health. In the case of wine, it kind of began with the interest around this component or this chemical compound, resveratrol, which was found in red wine. 
and if you take it in levels that you really can't achieve by just drinking red wine, but if it's concentrated and administered in very high levels, it had beneficial cardiovascular effects, specifically with atherosclerotic disease. That's one of the first associations I think of. And then there are probably other beneficial compounds within wine that in observational studies have shown positive influence on patients with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Broadly speaking, there are three major mechanisms by which polyphenols and other compounds favorably modulate nervous system function. They provide antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity, they modulate cell-to-cell signaling, and they disrupt amyloid plaque formation in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. But these effects are likely minimal unless you end up drinking enough to cause brain atrophy from alcohol toxicity. Ultimately, wine drinking in moderation probably does more for your mood than your mind. So what's your drink of choice? Recently, bourbon or whiskey-based drinks. Okay. That's the New Orleaner in you that I remember. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about before we wrap up this week? I think we've really touched on a lot of different food items, a lot of different interesting illnesses from infections, toxins, lack of something like a deficiency in a vitamin. Yeah, I think we've touched on a lot of those things. Is any of this information going to change the way that you eat or the way that you perceive the food on your Thanksgiving table? Not at all. All right, good. (laughs) That's what I want our listeners to take away from this episode, is just to be aware of these things, educate yourselves about the risks and the benefits of certain food items. I'm glad we got to spend this time kind of celebrating a holiday on the podcast, and I wish you and your family the best. Thank you, and you too, Jim. Again, that was Dr. Jason Maley from the University of Pennsylvania. That's it for Brainwaves for this week. I'm Jim Siegler. Stay tuned next week. Thanks for listening to Brainwaves today. If you like what you just heard, you can find more related material on the web at brainwaves.me or find us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. Feel free to contact us at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our iTunes archive for older episodes. This episode was produced by Jim Siegler. Music by the Advent Chamber Orchestra. Kevin McLeod. I'm Erica Mejia. Join us next time for another edition of Brainwaves. Waves.